What if your ex was using your child to spy on you? Dorothy's suspicion leads her down a dark path filled with shocking discoveries. This is one story you won't want to miss. Before we begin, hit the like button, subscribe, and turn on notifications so you never miss a story. After their child, Aiden, came into the world, Dorothy and her spouse, Michael, experienced a challenging split a few months later. Coping with the shared parenting duties proved complex due to their strained connection, particularly concerning their infant. However, setting their differences aside, they arrived at a compromise to ensure both had equal time with Aiden and that he continued to have a happy childhood. They opted to swap Aiden's stay every week between them. One day while Aiden was staying with Dorothy, she noted a strange habit he was developing. At around noon, Aiden wandered into their lounge, tugged at his trousers, and peered into them for an unusually long time. Initially, Dorothy dismissed it as an ordinary, youthful curiosity. Still, when Aiden's behavior continued throughout the week, she felt an unmistakable pang of concern. Observational curiosity was standard for Aiden, but focusing on his trousers seemed out of the ordinary. No physical irregularities became apparent with Aiden upon an exhaustive examination by Dorothy, yet she couldn't set aside her apprehension. His recurring pattern indicated something in addition to just a passing interest. This particular behavior pattern was apparent even when Aiden stayed with Michael. Intent on decoding the root cause of this abnormality, Dorothy kept a wary eye on Aiden, sure there was a profound explanation for this uncharacteristic behavior. The preceding day, the same unusual incident occurred again, precisely at 12.13 p.m. I couldn't help but posit that there was a correlation with this timing. Seeking to validate her hypothesis, Dorothy ensured she observed Aiden the next day at the same time, only to see him repeating his actions. It became inevitably clear that this recurring event was not a random act. After Aiden resumed his stay with his father, Dorothy's companion, Olivia, dropped in for a visit. Still befuddled by the repetitive pattern in Aiden's behavioral change, Dorothy trusted Olivia with the puzzling sequences of actions that Aiden had been showcasing. As Dorothy discussed this with Olivia, her response incited a grim realization. The thought crept in. Could Michael, Dorothy's former husband, be the instigator behind Aiden's atypical behavior? Not long before Aiden's change in conduct, Dorothy had initiated a new romantic relationship. Soon after Michael got wind of this, he penned a spiteful letter to Dorothy, full of vitriolic threats. One threat stood out conspicuously among the rest, an oath to ensure that Dorothy led a troubled life. This revelation sowed a seed of doubt in Dorothy's mind. Could Michael be influencing Aiden subtly to cause her distress? Was he using their son as a tool to keep surveillance on Dorothy's life? Though reluctant and disturbed by these thoughts, Dorothy found it hard to turn a blind eye to the accumulating evidence. Michael's past irrational conduct and the distinct green-eyed monster had only further fueled her doubts. As Dorothy pondered over this predicament, the possibility of Aiden being manipulated as a tool in Michael's deception seemed increasingly likely. Dorothy, who held a part-time job, usually got back home just before midday, which aligned with the commencement of Aiden's odd behavior that usually kicked off at 12.13 p.m. Toe-to-toe -to -toe with her suspicions, she decided to delve deeper, convinced that Michael might have hidden a tracking device or chip in Aiden's attire. Every single piece of clothing of Aiden's was inspected by Dorothy with an eye for detail, and she also looked in his diaper, but her actions were of no use. Despite her exhaustive scrutiny, there was no sign of covert tracking machinery anywhere. Frustration brewed and spirits sunk as Dorothy had to face the harsh truth that her suspicions may have been misplaced. Her meticulous efforts couldn't uncover the truth. She was left grappling with apprehension. Even though Dorothy couldn't find any tangible proof, she stubbornly held on to her belief that Michael was surveilling her, exploiting their son in his twisted strategy. Determined to bring his truth to light, Dorothy hatched a plan to outwit him. Dorothy placed a call to the local law enforcement, expressing her disturbing predicament while she was in the same room as Aiden. The police acted swiftly dispatching officers to both Dorothy's and Michael's homes. Soon enough, Michael was apprehended and taken for grilling, a development that made Dorothy feel reassured. 
Just when she thought she had her victory, her joy turned to confusion when police officers turned up at her doorstep. Feeling both frightened and unsure, she cautiously let them in, questioning their intent. To her utter surprise, they revealed that Michael, despite his apparent innocence during the grilling, had mired Dorothy in his plot. The officer laid out the details of Michael's deceptive acts, and Dorothy found herself in a whirlpool of fear and disbelief. The confidence she had about Michael's guilt was shaken up by his convincing act during the grilling, which made her question her foresight. The disclosure that Michael seemed truly oblivious to the arrest undermined Dorothy's suspicions further, leaving her feeling exposed and unsure. Faced with the unnerving reality of Michael's conniving persona, Dorothy prepared herself to face the stark reality of her ex-husband's true colors. The officer who had come to Dorothy's house finally explained the true purpose behind his visit. Concerned about Aiden's well-being, they needed to confirm that he wasn't in danger from any spying devices. With Dorothy's approval, the officer unveiled a professional instrument to examine Aiden. Despite her unease, Dorothy agreed, looking for assurance but was afraid of the potential negative outcome. As the officer carefully inspected Aiden, the intensity in the room escalated. After several meticulous moments of the examination, the officer made an unexpected statement. There were no spying devices detected on Aiden, and although seemingly positive news, Dorothy couldn't disregard her residual uncertainty. Was this honestly the conclusion of her concerns, or was Michael savvier than she had ever considered? Following the officer's exit, Dorothy was left battling with doubt her thoughts swarmed with unresolved queries, just as she believed she couldn't withstand the anxiety any longer. A sudden phone ring broke the quietness, anticipating belligerence or additional threats from Michael. Dorothy was hesitant before reluctantly picking up the call, mentally preparing herself for an altercation. Nonetheless, to her surprise, Michael's voice was not hostile or accusatory. On the contrary, he calmly initiated the process of relaying his own experiences post-police intervention. Dorothy listened in shock when Michael disclosed unexpected facts about his situation, leaving her staggered with a blend of puzzlement and anxiety about forthcoming events. It seemed like Michael had no suspicion of Dorothy's involvement in the police intervention. He inquired if the officials had also paid her a visit. This pushed Dorothy to admit openly about her actions. She confessed to alerting the police prompted by the menacing letter and Aiden's strange behavior citing a need for precaution. Unexpectedly, Michael's response took her by surprise. He presented a heartfelt apology, attributing the letter to a moment of rage and assuring Dorothy of his innocence concerning any spying accusations. Delving deeper into Aiden's unusual behavior, Dorothy hinted at the probability of similar events when Aiden was with Michael. To her surprise, Michael verified that Aiden exhibited the same behavior at his residence, further complicating the enigma. With no definite solutions evident, Dorothy and Michael understood the exigency of the situation and considered a remedy. Their mutual agreement led them to arrange a consultation with a local physician to evaluate Aiden's mental state. Despite Aiden's initial hesitancy, he was persuaded into the doctor's consulting room with the promise of a sweet treat if he behaved himself. A comprehensive examination was carried out by the doctor, but unfortunately for Dorothy, no clear explanation was uncovered for Aiden's uncharacteristic actions. The only advice given was to keep a close eye on him. Leaving the office, Dorothy felt dispirited by the lack of clear solutions. Even as she held out hopes for a conclusive resolution, Dorothy was left mystified by Aiden's continuous peculiar actions. The inputs from Michael during Aiden's visits didn't lead to any tangible conclusions. Dorothy resorted to devouring the internet and digesting numerous parenting publications in a bid to understand, only to find herself at a dead end. None of the materials provided any enlightenment regarding Aiden's strange behaviors, which left Dorothy feeling progressively hopeless. Just as she was resigning herself to the unfortunate reality, a phone call came in from her GP, hinting at a possible breakthrough. At the request of the doctor for an immediate appointment to see Aiden, Dorothy's anxiety levels soared in anticipation. As she lined up for another rendezvous scheduled for the following day, she mused over the potential revelations that lay ahead. On reaching the physician's chambers on the agreed day, an air of anticipated optimism was palpably present. 
Her curiosity had been piqued by the unusual request from the doctor for a lunchtime appointment that necessitated getting Aiden ready earlier than the norm. A niggling sense of unease, however, dogged Dorothy as she wondered what lay in store for them at this unusual time. In a more solemn tone than before, the doctor outlined his plans to observe Aiden's behavior directly. As the prearranged time neared, they watched the clock with mounting tension as it ticked towards 12.13 p.m., Aiden's usual time for his bizarre ritual. As the appointed date and time approached, all eyes were focused on Aiden. The moment of truth had finally arrived. As the hands of the clock moved towards 12.13 p.m., Dorothy and the doctor held their breath in expectation of Aiden's typical routine. But much to their surprise, Aiden remained stationary, not exhibiting any of his usual behaviors. The unforeseen break in pattern left the doctor puzzled, leading him to take a high-stakes gamble. Dorothy was left puzzled by the unexpected sequence of events that transpired when the doctor inquired about her preferred radio frequency while switching on the mic. Before resuming his place, the doctor, complying with her preference, adjusted the radio to broadcast the selected station. The following events left Dorothy completely surprised. In a short span, Aiden's demeanor completely shifted. To Dorothy's astonishment, he immediately pulled his trousers down and focused his gaze downwards. This happened before he continued to gaze downwards. An insightful smile from the surgeon suggested a deeper understanding of the situation, prompting Dorothy to mentally prepare for an explanation. The surgeon's smile led to a revelation. The doctor hypothesized that Aiden's actions were nothing more than an attempt to sway along with the tune. Due to Aiden's lack of conventional dancing skills, he resorted to this atypical form of expression. Dorothy struggled to digest this peculiar revelation. Could Aiden's seemingly abnormal behavior be a naively innocent way of expressing himself? The disclosure left Dorothy both relieved and amazed, leading her to understand that her son's actions were merely misunderstood musical engagement. Realizing this, Dorothy immediately signed Aiden up for toddler dance classes. The doctor had assured her that with gentle motivation and the right guidance, Aiden would outgrow this phase. As he began to receive the appropriate training, Aiden learned to express himself through movement, thus putting an end to his strange behavior. The reason for him pulling down his trousers concludes the first story. Now let's move on to a related story. The baby's belly kept swelling without any pause, leading her family to an extremely distressing revelation. Steve Tenney, a U.S. Army veteran who had been with the Keene Police Department for 18 years, hadn't sought major medical attention for his discomfort in about a decade. Besides a few stitches occasionally, he had never been hospitalized for a long duration or diagnosed with a severe ailment. Even though he was already in his 40s, he was a paragon of robust health, keeping fit and even training middle school football at his old stomping grounds, the Monadnock Regional High School. Yet on September 8th, surgeons at the Leahy Medical Center in Burlington, Massachusetts, extracted his entirely operational liver. This was after a week of comprehensive health and psychological evaluations, affirming that he was in excellent physical condition. Upon removal of approximately 20% of the organ, it was replaced into his body and he was stitched up appropriately. Here's Tenney's account of his experience. I woke up that day feeling like I had been run over by a truck. As the week commenced, Tenney and his liver managed to rescue the life of a four-month-old infant girl whom he hadn't yet laid eyes on during her time in the womb. Sarah S.T. James, a resident of Bourne, Massachusetts, on Cape Cod, had a rather straightforward gestation period. Sloan S.T. James is the second child born to Sarah and her husband, Chris S.T. James at James, currently the father of a young boy named Carter, who was two and a half years old, welcomed a little one, Sloan, to their family this past April. Sloan initially seemed completely healthy. However, as Sarah, an employed occupational therapist, and Chris, a professional working in the IT segment of Keoli's Commuter Services, observed Sloan at just two months old. They began to see signs of an issue. Sarah saw Sloan turning a yellowish color and noticed her belly growing disproportionately large, even though she was growing as expected and eating regularly. These observations gave Sarah and Chris a sense of unease. Sarah later shared, Chris and I both felt a persistent, nagging doubt in our minds that something was off. To ease their worries, the parents took Sloan to Boston Children's Hospital 
for her regular four-month checkup on August 8th instead of their local pediatrician's office. They needed assurance from specialized doctors that everything was all right before they could breathe easily. To their dismay, the healthcare professionals immediately voiced concerns upon seeing Sloan Hat Day. Soon enough, Sloan was diagnosed with biliary atresia, a disease marked by severely narrow, blocked, or absent bile ducts, which disrupt proper liver function. If noticed when a baby is newly born, this health issue often can be resolved without surgical intervention. However, for Sloan, the severity of her situation had escalated to stage four. This means that she had to undergo a liver transplant without further delay. Sloan's parents, shocked, stated, we were hoping for some assurance that all was well, but instead we faced utter devastation. Despite all this, Sloan's persistent yellowing and her continually expanding stomach, they maintained a spark of hope that perhaps things were not as severe as they seemed. In a hopeful tone, the parents expressed, you picture the worst case scenario, but you immediately dismiss it, thinking, no, it can't be the worst case. Initially, Sloan was added to the waiting list for deceased organ donors, but as her health condition kept getting critically worse, it became evident that Sloan had to be rushed back to Children's Hospital by Labor Day weekend after only a short break home in late August. As the days passed, it became noticeably clear that Sloan's life depended on finding a live organ donor, a strategy that's only employed about 10% of the time. The parents confessed, after six days in the hospital, we knew we weren't going back home anytime soon, hinting at Sloan's rapid health decline. The rules for accepting a live donor were strict. The donor had to be either a family member or a close associate, and their decision to donate had to be willingly made. In addition to the physical part of this competition, a psychiatric evaluation was also a requirement due to the abundant amount of risks and ethical implications present. Steve Tenney, who is connected to the St. James family through his sibling, Jake, expressed his enthusiasm to join the search for a donor by announcing his involvement. Despite the Tenney's only having met with the St. James once or twice at gatherings, they felt compelled to aid them. Tenney's blood type ended up matching Sloan's, a revelation that swiftly passed among their circle of acquaintances, expanded by a GoFundMe website and numerous online spaces. However, this was just the maiden step in a substantially long procedure. After assessing Tenney's suitability, Leahy Hospital reached out to him. Despite the likelihood that it might affect his career as a lieutenant in the Keene Police Department, both Tenney and his spouse agreed enthusiastically, viewing it as their responsibility. Tenney expressed, underpinned by the belief that it was their obligation to assist when a child was in need. Upon completion of the initial evaluations at Cheshire Medical Center, Tenney proceeded to a more extensive screening procedure at Leahy Hospital in Burlington. Due to Sloan's critical health situation, a process that would typically span a few weeks was fast forwarded to just one week, with one potential donor candidate being tested at a time. Starting from September 1st, Tenney went to Leahy Hospital, where he would encounter multiple procedures for a week. A detailed exam, including numerous blood sample collections, was conducted on Tenney. This included CT scans, MRIs, and liver biopsies. Moreover, three-dimensional imaging of his liver was performed as part of the complex transplant method, operating in parallel with a lab located in Germany. A significant concern was the compatibility of Tenney's veins and vessels with Sloan's. The count of veins and vessels had to be matched, Tenney observed. If he had an excess, it would make closing them off virtually impossible. As the clock continued to tick, the initial trepidation swiftly transformed into a concoction of thrill and unease about the impending events. In the beginning, I experienced a blend of apprehension and anticipation. As per Tenney's statement, things began to improve as the days progressed, and it became evident that he was an ideal match. Concurrently, Sloan's health began to spiral, amplifying the urgency for the operation. The patient's family underwent an unusual emotional roller coaster of optimism and concern upon entrusting her to the medical professionals. By the date of September 8th, surgical groups from Burlington and Boston congregated, preparing for the intricate operation due to the arrival of Sloan's replacement organ. Precision was crucial during the removal of her deteriorated organ. Images of Tenney's robust organ portrayed a stark contrast to Sloan's shriveled, lifeless original stored in his mobile device. With the successful conclusion of both operations, 
Sloan was quickly on the mend. Following nearly eight weeks, Sloan is currently adhering to a prescribed medication schedule aimed at warding off organ rejection and infection. Despite periodic visits to the children's hospital for adjustments of her medication, her resilience never wavers as her bright smile remains intact. St. James proudly voiced the physician's confidence in Sloan, leading a routine life despite her struggles. Tenny's stay in the hospital totaled five days, followed by a brief period of living near the medical center before returning home. The journey to regain his strength was gradual, yet he successfully resumed his full-time responsibilities. When the St. James family journeyed to the Cape to visit Sloan, their regard for him as a hero was solidified. He is indeed Sloan's hero. St. James spoke about Tenny, referring to their initial interactions as proof of Tenny's character. He went on to say that there are still some amazing individuals out there in the world. Upon reflection, Tenny asserts that he wouldn't alter anything about his past encounters. Speaking from personal experience, he stated that he would encourage others to follow a similar route as this is a rewarding process both for contribution and reciprocity. The whole experience was remarkable, according to St. James. It is to be hoped that Tenny felt a sense of satisfaction and pride in his achievements. He certainly deserves such recognition. Amidst the trials faced, a beautiful bond was formed between Tenny and Sloan, a bond expected to last a lifetime. The recount above forms today's engaging story. If it resonates with you, don't forget to subscribe, like, and join us again next time.